So to start, who is Wild Justice and what are the aims and objectives? Who wants to who wants to answer that first? Well, I will if you like. So it's us three. Uh, so we set up Wild Justice so that instead of working occasionally together on things, we could do some bigger things together. And um, uh, it's kind of changed a bit since we set it up in October 2018. Yeah. But um, we're here to use the law on behalf of wildlife because wildlife can't take legal cases. So it needs three part-time inadequate go-betweens between threatened wildlife and some really good lawyers who take our cases on behalf of wildlife to the law and we do some campaigning as well but it's just a hobby really as you can see so does is there a is there a grand plan to wild justice's work or you had this thrown at you probably many many times is there a hidden agenda that a lot of people ask i don't think there's a hidden agenda in any way shape or form actually we, we tested an idea because we come up with that idea and we'd identified that the NGOs and others weren't using the law in this way so we saw a vacant niche if you like in conservation we happened to bump into a, a bunch of lawyers that were very interested in the cases that we were thinking about bringing so we sniffed around to see if any of those cases had any potential legal validity any legal future um, we listen very carefully to their advice and they probe and, and, and come up with you know, little reports for us and then we can make decisions as to whether we want to progress or not. So we kind of tested the water and it worked and, and then people have come to us and we've come up with other ideas and we don't currently see any restrictions in terms of what we might do in the future other than the fact that there were three of us and Mark's still doing most of the work. But you know, at, at, you know, at a certain point you know, there may be the capacity to expand what we're doing, but we'll, we'll, we'll just see. But we don't see, you know, any, any box. So, you know, we are interested in issues, you know, which may do, you know, have uh, implications on the shooting fraternity, but then we're also interested in badgers, pesticides, water quality, anything really, where we feel that there's a potential case which could change people's thinking when it comes to the health of wildlife and our landscape. So how did it come about? Who's uh, The three of you obviously know each other and you can touch on that, how you know each other individually from you know years gone by. But where did that, that sort of moment go? We could do something here. We could make a difference. And what roles... I think people would love to know what roles you each individually play. Obviously, we've just touched on Mark does most of the work, but I'll let... <laughs> you can defend your own positions if you want. He does. It's true. <laughs> So well, we, well, you're good at where it came from because I've heard you talk about that before. <laughs> it it came from um, it it came it came it came from a, a meeting that we had with some lawyers to see what we could do. But but before before that, it came from um, a shared feeling of frustration of uh, of things going wrong, and particularly I think for me particularly the thing that that triggered it was. Um, a couple of years ago there were five prosecutions that were dropped by the Crown Office in Scotland one after the other uh, quite clear-cut cases what looked to be quite clear-cut cases um, they were all dropped at the last minute you know virtually on on the eve of the trial um, and when the Crown Office were asked for an explanation um, nothing was forthcoming and they don't have to tell you yeah. why, why they make those decisions so there was a sense of you know um, we need to try something else because it's, the system's clearly not working as it is um, we, we knew each other from uh, Hen Harrier Day mostly from 2014 um, uh, and we'd worked worked separately on projects I'd worked with Chris on something Chris and Mark had, had been working on something um, so of course we all knew each other as as that and then we we knew some lawyers who were interested in what we're doing and who Mark had worked with on some other stuff and we just had a, a bit of a uh, session with them around a whiteboard seeing you know, what what can we do um, and their advice was to form uh, a legal entity um, to, to take cases so 
um, we went to the pub after that meeting and decided. <laughs> we're all good at it, it's formula. <laughs> yeah, and decided, uh, yeah, we were going to become an entity, a legal entity, and that's we did. And I know I've, I've written to me, Chris. I know in you're obviously very well known for being on on TV, and and Are you you've, on TV. You've had a lot of um, allegedly, <laughs> but there's a lot more to you um, than than being an on-screen naturalist, but things have been thrown at you regarding you know your links with the bbc or wh wh whoever you're working for do you ever do you ever worry about it jeopardizing that part of your career or well i, I mean I, I i have a vocational career you know so i'm very fortunate that i'm able to um to communicate my passion and enthusiasm for wildlife on tv but I have a purpose for doing that outside of TV, and that is to engender a greater interest in it, and therefore a desire to look after it. So, you know, if I can recruit people through the media of TV, um, through an interest, not a directed campaigning way, but, you know, through opening their eyes to the simple beauty of nature around them, and therefore a desire to protect it, then that's part and parcel of the, of, of the mission. So, you know, I'm, I work very closely with the, the BBC and others. Um, they're not my principal employers, as it turns out, during the course of the year, but I do make programmes for the BBC, and I work very closely with them to protect their impartiality, which is something that I firmly believe in. I'm, you know, I like the BBC. I think it's one of the best brands left in Britain. Um, I think it's really important that we have an independent, impartial uh, broadcasting uh, you know, media. Um, it's either that or Fox News. What do you want? Mm. You know, we don't want Murdoch. We do want people who can, you know, investigate and report on, you know, without uh, completely independently on on everything that goes on. So I'm, I jealously protect that. I don't want to compromise them or myself. So I work really closely to make sure that you know no lines are crossed, and and that allows me to do both of those things. But. Um, that, you know, there's no question that from my point of view, as I've got older, particularly, you know, I've realised that I've got less time to exact an influence and therefore I need to do it more efficiently, and which is another reason why we share a passion for, you know, wild justice. As Marx intimated, you know, we are able to do things more efficiently because there are just three of us. We largely agree about everything. We, you know, we haven't overstretched ourselves, a man and woman. Um, and collective needs to know its limitations and, and we're sticking within those which is why we remain at the moment you know on a firm footing and, and making progress. Another thing I wanted to ask you was sort of try and give people an insight into behind the scenes you're, you're in a pub or you're you know you're you're in one of your back gardens discussing who who out of the three of you you don't tries to push the boundaries or maybe a little bit sometimes you have to rein them in is either of the three i'm i'm well aware and obviously i want to make the point that legal challenges are a very serious thing so i'm I, i'm not taking that lightly but just you know maybe tongue in cheek is there anyone who really pushes the chris is the bravest yeah That's ruth and i ruth and i when we talk about things we go yeah. Do we want to do this? Well, Chris is going to want to do it. So if <laughs> okay. we don't want to do it, we better, you know, decide that we really don't want to do it. And no, no, Chris is... Chris, uh, is, and it's because we're all different that it yeah. works. That's one of your lines as well. But it is because we're all different. And Chris is, you know, Chris is definitely the one who goes, oh, sod it, let's do it. Sometimes completely wrongly and recklessly, but he hasn't got us into any big, big trouble yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not not. I, I, I'll get into big trouble on my own outside of yeah, wild justice. Yeah, I'm sure, but I really mean, the, appreciate you only d getting into big trouble on your own. But the point is that, to be quite honest, for a, a long time, you know, I've considered you know Ruth and Mark as trusted colleagues. So even if I am doing things independently, I wouldn't do them without consulting them and I and and listening to their uh, advice you know I, I, I've been aware since I was a small child as my mother would say you never know when to stop you always have to you, you always have to go one step beyond you have to say that one thing that you shouldn't say or do that one thing that you shouldn't do 
Um, and I know, that's, no. I, I, know, I know that's part of my character, <laughs> and I think it can be advantageous, but I've also got to a point where I will think, well, do you know what? Actually, it's not just about me now. It's actually about us. Even if I'm doing something independently, that doesn't mean that I wouldn't consult yeah. Mark and Ruth and take their advice. And I do listen. Uh, I, I, I do listen to them. Up to a point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do listen to them up to a point. I do listen to them. And, 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 and you know, the point is that I'm able to access an enormous amount of intelligence and experience in a, in a focused arena, which is the business of conservation in the UK. So I consider, uh, uh, you know, I'm very privileged to have access to two people who act as gurus like that, you know. And again, as Mark says, you know, you, you need a fire starter from time to time, and, and that may be my part of my role. For Ruth, I'd put about you. You come across as the calm, silent one, and that when, oh. and when, the, when the calm oh, wrong, on. wrong on both games. When the calm, silent one speaks, <laughs> then everyone should listen. But obviously, oh, yeah, I, obviously. I, I'd agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we do. You're in a you're in a car on your way to an event. Um, who's in charge of navigation? Who's in charge of snacks? And who's in charge of the music? <laughs> the music. The, the, the music. Be, the be, <laughs> the music. There'd be no music. Oh, really? Oh, right. We okay. wouldn't be able to agree Even on the music. Even with Chris in the car, there's no, no music. There'd be no, no music. No, no, no. No. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, now, actually, some of Chris's likes and music I would share, but yeah. it would be pretty yeah. difficult for the three of us we'd, to we'd agree could, on. We could a... maybe listen to Sex Pistols. I think we'd all yeah. we'd all listen okay. to that. Yeah, but we'd all be talking all the time uh, anyway. Yeah. So. Okay, so yeah. no, no yeah. music. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ruth well, would be maybe... navigating. Ruth, Ruth would be navigating. Yeah. yeah. Maybe she'll get us that. lost, of course. Ruth knows the way to <laughs> strange little spots in the, well, in the back end of sport, in yeah. Scotland. You know, yeah. she, she can find her way in the dark to a grouse spot on the moor in Scotland. So, you know, so we take her advice on geography. Fair enough. And we can, yeah. Okay, I'll let you decide on the snacks and the music at a later day. <laughs> well, Ruth would bring mints, okay. yep. for sure. Mint Imperials. Yeah. You tried yeah. to pull me off with a mint imperial this morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. for <laughs> can't, sure. Can't go so anywhere in the car without a mint si imperial. There's an uh, <laughs> exclusive revelation. <laughs> I can't believe we've got so much airtime out of this question. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Right, more importantly, each individually, can you recollect a moment or an incident? I know R Ruth touched on something earlier when it sort of sunk in and you thought, Hmm, yeah, th this is really wrong. There's something not right with what's happening in our uplands. Mark, go first. Well, I think it, I think for me it is something that has gradually become more and more obvious. So when I worked for the RSPB at first, we used to think that grouse moors were quite good because they weren't too many sheep and they weren't a load of conifer plantations. But during the time I worked for the RSPB, that view changed. Uh, and it's changed in the nine and a bit years since I left the RSBB. But a seminal point was on my birthday, I don't know whether it was 2014, when Chris and I were at a Hampshire Ornithological Society conference, and he's the president of it, I think, because he's mm -hmm. president of almost everything. Mm -hmm. So he was there. Not and the I United was... States of America at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be a different world, I so, promise you. So yeah. They've elected stranger people than you. <laughs> <laughs> they have. Um, and I was giving a talk, and I was kind of sitting at the back. You know, I got there early. I always get there early. Uh, and Chris came and talked to me, and we started talking about um, Ken Harrier persecution and grouse moors and stuff. And Chris said he was going to say something about it. And I said, well, I'm going to say something about it in what I'm going to say. And Chris said, oh, well, I'll talk about Malta and Cyprus and stuff, but I'll back up what you've said. So, but we had that chat, do you remember? At yep. The back of the lecture theatre. In Manchester, yeah. And um, we decided we were going to do something. Well, the, and uh, we kind of promised each other we were going to do something. I don't think we decided what we were going to do, but I think it was partly out of that that, the idea for Hen Harrier Day came along, Brilliant. and then you know, and um, well, that was that was quite important for me that conversation. But it wasn't. There was no worries about it before, and then it was all worries yeah, afterwards. Yeah, yeah. But that was an important point. A show of hands for for the licensing of driven grouse shooting. 
depends. Well, only oh, if it's... Okay. Oh, okay. Well, well as a, <laughs> not as the thing I'd really want, but as a thing that would be better than nothing. So, show of hands <laughs> for the current situation. Show of hands for the banning of driven grouse shooting. Okay. <laughs> Now you can now you can digress if you want. I wasn't expecting that sort of depends maybe based on the current situation, but okay, it was just to give people an idea tuning in that yeah. Well, it depends for, for me. It depends as in Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it looks like like we're on the verge of, of getting a licensing system there, um, and ideally you'd you'd want them to ban it, but the Scottish government are never going to go straight from having it to banning, banning it. it there's that intermediate step and the intermediate step is licensing it so if if they license it and licensing is enforced and it's a decent system and it works fine i'd be happy with licensing yeah. i don't believe that, that that will happen i don't believe it will work um so i would expect them to to license and then i'd be looking uh for a ban if licensing didn't work so it's kind of the middle step I understand why you know licensing seems on paper to be a, a good thing to do. I just wonder how we'd implement it. You know, I'm I'm a practical prag pragmatist. Where, where's the money going to come from? Where are the staff? Who's going to monitor it? Um, um, who's going to um, you know punish it? You know, how's that going to work? You know, and and if we entrust the sector itself to do that, which we've been trying to do for years and years, you know, because there were continual promises that they won't do this and they won't do that and they won't do that. You know, we've had you know moratorium on burning. Burning continues. We've had we're going to not kill any more raptors. Raptor killing continues. There's no ability for them to self-regulate. So let them let alone self-regulate when it comes to their own licensing. It would be entirely, you know, useless. So I just wonder where there's no there's no money when you think the statutory bodies have been cut, cut, cut and cut. You know, who's that, who's going to go out on the ground, and who could be trusted to go out on the ground and make sure that there are species living here, here and here. I just can't see that happening in the, in the short term. We're heading into an enormous recession. There's not going to be money being pumped back into DEFRA's biodiversity budget and, and SNH and so on and so forth. So I can't see licensing being able to practically work, even if there was a desire for it, which you know, there, there wouldn't be within that, at that fraternity. Um, there would be a desire to abuse it. So I think, you know, you know as ever, cut the crap and just go straight for the result, which is a ban. But as Mark has explained, you know, that, you know, for, for, for other political reasons, rather than practical and pragmatic, that, that's, pro that's probably not going to happen. So we'll probably have to go through this torturous period, as we're going through a torturous period now, waiting for a consultation, having had expert advice presented to the Scottish Government, rather than make up its own mind, the Scottish Government are putting it out for consultation to all of the people that don't want it to happen. <laughs> Um, and, and, and then it'll come back and it'll be, you know, this is how political things get diluted and diluted and, and staved off for years and years. But in the years and years, the body count just keeps building up. And what's m more important, I think, Jimmy, now is it's not just the body count that's building up. It's people's, you know, much more broad, you know, antipathy for this. It's not just us three that are angry about it. There's an increasing number of people that are angry about it. And it's not just about raptor persecution. It's the fact that the uplands aren't serving their, you know, economic potential. It's that there, you know, there are concerns about climate change, about flooding, so on and so forth. There's a plethora of things that people have woken up to. Um, and that is, you know, building an enormous amount of pressure against this driven grouse shooting industry. And, and the... That, you know, the, the most remarkable thing is, from my perspective, is that it, that driven ground shooting industry cannot see it's at the, point, at the point of self-reform or bust. I don't, I don't get it. Because if I was staring down the barrel, the double barrel of uh, Holland and Holland with an enormous number of environmentalists and, and conservationists with their fingers on the trigger, I'd be trying to dodge it and get things done and sort my act out. But they're ploughing on regardless. They're still poisoning, trapping, shooting birds and getting caught out. Madness. Absolute madness. Let's talk about some of the techniques or plans that the government have, mm. have put in place as part of their action plan to, to save the species of hen harriers and in particular the brood management plan. Um, just for anyone that's tuning in that doesn't know what what I've just said, brood management. Does anyone want to 
touch on what it is first before we get your opinions on it. You should have that one. What's your? Uh, I think you mean brood meddling in our <laughs> parlance. Parlance. Mm. Um, but the idea is, uh, well, it's an idea that came from the shooting community for a start, and is supported by the shooting community, but not by raptor workers, not by us, not by the RSPB, not by conservationists. So that tells you, kind of gives you a framework to work in. Um, <clears throat> hen harriers uh, do eat red grouse. They don't only eat red grouse, but they eat red grouse. So they're not welcome on grouse moors. And so the solution to that is to kill them illegally because you don't get caught. So if you could come up with some plan that got rid of the hen harriers legally and stopped them eating grouse on your grouse moor, that would be good. And that's what we see brood meddling as being. So if you have uh, a pair of hen harriers on your land and it's a grouse moor and there's another pair of hen harriers fairly close, then one of those pairs, the eggs or chicks, can be taken away, reared in captivity, mm -hmm. so that pair are not feeding their young so they're not eating as many red grouse so as a grouse moor manager you're getting what you want and then they're reared in captivity and then they're brought back to somewhere in the vicinity and released so they're removed and then kind of reintroduced nearby the trouble is um, they then get bumped off in the way that we know that if they'd been left to fledge they would get bumped off so there is no gain you have to to solve the lack of hen harriers you have to solve the problem and the problem is illegal persecution and brood meddling doesn't deliver that now if you were in favor of it you'd say ah but the advantage of getting rid of them for us for the season means that grass moor managers will be much more relaxed about having hen harriers well uh, it appears not because the ones that fledge still get killed the five uh, chicks from the one brood medal nest last year they're all dead they haven't all necessarily been bumped off but they're all dead so we haven't hen harriers haven't gained anything so far and we haven't seen the flood of new hen harrier nests because uh, there ought to be 330 pairs of them in England and by the rumours there might be 20 this year yeah. which is a pretty good year but actually there were 30 pairs in just the forest of Boland back in the 70s and the 80s so it's not, it's not as though we're being given anything but so much has been taken away and little scraps are being given back and, and, and the shooting fraternity want to celebrate this as an increase in birds. So when it goes from 5 to 10, or from 10 to 12, you know, they champion those percentage increases and, and want a fanfare. When, when it, it, as Mark said, you know, in our lifetimes, these birds were considerably more abundant. So they've killed them, killed them, killed them, and then a couple more breed, and apparently that's a conservation success. Well, no, it isn't. Get off. Get out. <laughs> You know, we're not interested in that sort of nonsensical science. And that's another one of the, the things that you know, we've been very keen to do, and all of us do it independently, and that is that when it comes to speaking out against persecution and any of these other issues, our foundation is always from a good, solid backstop of peer-reviewed science. We can get very upset about what happens out there, you know, we do get very upset. We do have an emotional reaction to those sorts of things, but it's not the emotional reaction that informs us our action. You know, it's that science. We've got the figures, we've got the data, we've got all of the satellite tracking data. We know what's going on to the best of our abilities, and what's going on is a travesty. And no amount of spin or lies or, 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 or anything else can dissuade us from that fact. Because and we've got the evidence. So I, what really disappoints me, well, maybe I shouldn't be disappointed, but I'm a bit younger than you three, so maybe I've got still stuff to learn. Oh, okay. um, you know, look it. Just to, it might be this. <laughs> um, is natural England. That, that's what disappoints me, is that our you know, government body is, is at the helm of this. Um, and I know, Ruth, you've had some dealings with 
natural England in terms of this year's was it he had an email or something you've discussed or tried to get some information out of them regarding last year's maybe and, and this year's correct me what if I'm wrong yeah well we've all had dealings with <laughs> with natural England trying to get information out of them um, and and I get complaints about the number of FOIs that, that I submit but you know the answer to that is well if you're more transparent and put this information up on your website anyway we wouldn't have to spend all this time asking for it via FOI you know this is public interest well it's public money yeah yeah That's public money yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it's very difficult to to get information from them they're quite adept at, at hiding stuff that they don't want to give you um, and you have to be quite persistent you know they'll they'll refuse quite often they'll refuse on on the initial request um, and you have to go in again and ask for a review which takes more time and they kind of hope that you're going to get bored and forget um, but we're not good <laughs> but doesn't this strike you as strange how a publicly funded government body which has the auspices of looking after wildlife and the natural environment has to be constantly quizzed by members of the public who have an interest in that wildlife. It, uh, what, what, what does that say fundamentally about the position that we are in? It's an unhealthy position. Yeah. It, it, it suggests to me that that, that government body is, is in a position where it's, it understands itself that it's not doing its duty because it's attempting to hide that by you know, not putting that information in, in the public domain and trying to restrict a access to it anyway. And with that that is a w one thing which will highlight the difficulty of our position. You know, everything is a struggle. You can't even get the basic information from the people that we pay to gather the basic information. And, and that means that, you know, we're in, a, it, we're in a bad place when it comes to conservation and environmental care. And that's, you know, why not just wild justice, but others have to step up to the plate. Because if we sit back like we used to in the old days, it will go to hell in a handcart. Because the people with their, you know, their hands on the reins have either lost a grip or, or they're going in the wrong direction. How important have you found satellite tags for, for birds of prey in, in the fight, I suppose? In, in, in terms of persecution, mm. um, they've, they've shone an incredibly bright light on some pretty dark areas that, that we wouldn't have known about before. And that fitting satellite tags, certainly the projects that, that we're involved with, uh, and our colleagues elsewhere in the UK fitting satellite tags is to detect persecution isn't the objective of, of why we fit satellite tags. We're fitting tags because we're looking at a, a, a much broader research field and we're able to answer all sorts of research questions that we wouldn't have been able to answer if satellite tags didn't exist. Um, so the ability to, to to see where a lot of them are disappearing or are being killed um, on such a fine scale has been game-changing, I think. If you look at the, um, the Golden Eagle satellite tag report from Scotland a couple of years ago and the Hen Harrier one from, from last year, um, you know, it's compelling evidence of, of what's going on, if, as if we needed it. There's already compelling evidence, there's heaps of compelling evidence. There's papers going back years, there's corpses going back years. Uh, we all knew what was going on, but, uh, but to have that level of detail from those tags um, has, has definitely been game-changing. And I think, I think the results from those two reports, um, when we look back on, on what happens in the next few years, I think we'll all be looking at those two reports and saying, yep, yeah, uh, they played a huge part in, in how things have changed. Um, the Hen Harrier paper, which is, uh, so that was done with, it was an NE study, really. They started it off, it yeah. was analysed by NE and some clever academics who did some really good analysis. Um, but that just shows that the risk of death per unit time is 10 times higher on grouse moors than on other habitats. And it shows that these birds disappear all over the place. Well, again, Natural England haven't exactly trumpeted the results of their own study. Came out, but they don't say, hmm, 
it shows what a big problem we've got. And we don't have DEFRA ministers saying this study that was done by our statutory agency shows that hen harriers are at risk of death on grouse moors all over the north of England, which is what it shows. It's as though this study hadn't really been done and that we didn't know any of that stuff. It's not being fed into what government or agencies either say or do. It's a good example of a disc. I mean, people, politicians always talk about science-led, evidence-led policy. Well, we've got an evidence-ignoring policy on hen harriers. If there's one bit of advice or, or something that you can give people to take away from you know, listening to this interview today to, to help or make a difference, do you have anything that you can... Your voice matters. You've got a voice. And, uh, and if you don't raise it, if you don't you know, shout above the noise, that background noise <laughs> that's suppressing all of the sense and sensibility that we've got across the board, then you can never expect any form of justice in your life. You can't expect to pay the right amount of money for a loaf of bread you know, or, or anything else. You know, we are empowered, as Marcus said, in a relatively democratic society. We have the capacity to stand up and say what we think and to demand what we want. And you've got to do it. You know, we, we're doing it. But three people, you know, we, need, we need the weight of, of many others behind us. And I think the other thing you've got to do is you've got to try harder. Because in the past, people would say, oh, I really care about hen harriers. I really care about this desperate problem with persecution. Well, caring's no longer enough. You've got to do something now. You know, the, the days where people cared about stuff and, and that was their, you know, passport to being part of a responsible conservation community, that, that's finished. If you're not doing stuff now, if you're not pulling your weight and if you're not shouting above your noise, you, you're not in the club that's going to save the world. You know, you're having a copy with the vicar and I'm not interested in that, you know. So while Justice, we've how it started, and obviously we've touched on the fact there isn't really a grand plan, but we've certainly covered that there's a niche and you, you, you're filling that niche very well. Um, you've done fantastic work in terms of crowdfunding and then legal challenges, that's all there to show. Are there any, what's next on the agenda or can we cover that or is it all sort of under wraps? Uh, it's a secret, it's a secret because we don't know and we wouldn't <laughs> want to tell anybody anyway so it's a secret but but let's just go through what we have done we've done general licenses in england where there's going to be a new set of general licenses issued this autumn we don't know what they're going to look like but i bet they're going to be better than the ones that we challenged so that there ought to be some progress um Game birds. So we've had, it was only last week that we heard that we've got permission for judicial review on the unlimited release of game birds and their impacts on Natura 2000 sites. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, we heard this week, it was only this week, wasn't it, that our challenge on uh, general licences in Wales is going to judicial review. Might not win, but we've got over that hurdle. Uh, and we've started a case on badgers about uh, shooting being inhumane, which who knows where that will go. So in a way, we've only done four things. We haven't lost one yet. We will lose. We'll lose more than we, we win overall. But we are making a difference. Trouble is, none of them's finished yet. We can't, I think we thought, well, we'll start some legal cases. We'll either win or lose, and then we'll do some more. Well, we're still doing the ones that we started. They drag on. But, you know, uh, so we want to finish some as well as start some new ones. But it's a secret. But I think there's one thing we ought to stress, though. And, and that is it's not about winning. You know, everyone thinks so. You've got to go to court and you've got to come outside and be standing on the steps, like in all those sort of cop 
cop films, yeah. you know. And you're going to stand there with your lawyer beside you and you're going to have a big smile on your face. You're going to read a statement and everyone's going to clap and, and then, you know, the credits will roll. You know, even if we don't win any of these things, we would have made a noise. We would have got people to prick up their ears and think about what's going on. We would have even got people who you might consider to be our adversaries to think again about what they're doing. And, and amongst their ranks, those who are a bit more reasonable and maybe a little bit more savvy would have thought, yeah, do you know what, they might have a case. They might have a case. So from our point of view, of course we are taking legal cases where our lawyers think there is a chance of us winning. We're not squandering our crowdfunded money. There's no question about that. But ultimately, 96% of environmental cases taken in the UK are lost. Only 4% of them are won. And that's not a reflection on their validity, that's a reflection of the state of thinking in the UK at the moment, i.e. environment is second to planning or whatever else it has to be. But that doesn't mean that just because the, the win rate is 4% that you don't take the case. We don't take the cases to win, we take the cases because it's the right thing to do. And the spin-off of that is that we wake a lot of people up and they think it's the right thing to do too.